I want to welcome you all to our ninth uh, Quality Improvement Patient Safety Day, um, which uh, is something that started a number of years ago. And Dr. Four, uh, Dr. Robert Four, is going to give us a, uh, some introductory comments um, to kind of give us a, an understanding of what we're about. And then I will give you all a little bit of a, of a uh, idea about what the day ahead looks like. So let me welcome Dr. Four to the podium. Welcome. It's hard to believe this is the ninth annual. I've been to all of them and it doesn't seem like it's been that many or such a, a amount of time, but I want to welcome you again to our ninth annual patient safety quality day. This is one of the best responses, uh, the best uh, participation that we have had in our history. This couldn't happen without the leadership of people like Dr. Bennett and many others, and many of our faculty, resident leaders, uh, so many people who made this happen. But I want to uh, thank our judges today, Eileen Schrum, who's Patient Safety Quality Director here at Erlanger, Jill Steelman, Senior Director of Clinical Education, and Dr. Adam Campbell, who's our Vice President for Patient Safety and Quality. Well, why are we here? Well, we're here, the short answer is to improve the quality and safety of patient care within this clinical environment. Uh, it's always good if you're uh, part of graduate medical education, which we all are, it's a pretty good idea, pretty good uh, strategy to have a copy of the ACGME institutional requirements nearby, as well as a copy of the clinical learning environment review focus areas of which quality and safety are a major, are major components. Um, the institutional requirements in graduate medical education and the clear requirements uh, have uh, evolved and they have become more as one. They used to be very separate, but now they're kind of becoming just one document and one set of expectations. I want to just very quickly read a, a short paragraph to you from the common program requirements and their common program requirements because they apply to all of our residency programs, regardless of the specialty. And it says very clearly, all physicians share responsibility for promoting patient safety and enhancing quality of patient care. Graduate medical education must prepare residents to provide the highest level of clinical care with continuous focus on the safety, individual needs and humanity of their patients. It's the right of each patient to be cared for by residents who are appropriately supervised, possess the requisite knowledge, skills, and abilities, understand the limits of their knowledge and experience, and seek assistance as required to provide optimal patient care. Residents must demonstrate the ability to analyze the care they provide, understand their roles within the healthcare team, and play an active role in system improvement processes. Graduating residents will apply these skills to critique their future unsupervised practice and affect quality improvement measures. It's necessary for residents and faculty members to consistently work in a well-coordinated manner with other healthcare professionals to achieve organizational patient safety goals. I'm impressed uh, with the addition of uh, Dr. Campbell to our staff and the uh, increased involvement of Dr. Bennett. It's um, very satisfying to see how the relationship between Erlanger and the College of Medicine uh, is uh, getting closer in terms of our common goals for patient care and quality. So that's only going to get better. I think the future holds a lot of very good things for all of us in terms of quality of care. So again, welcome. We're glad to have you here. We appreciate your participation. For those of you who are presenting, please respect our time limits. Uh, we've had some experience with this, as we've mentioned, and I think the amount of time each presenter has been allotted should be more than sufficient to field questions and 
keep on track. So uh, with that, I'd like to ask Dr. Bennett to come back to the podium and just tell us kind of what's gonna happen after we're uh, done with our presentations. Dr. Bennett. Thank you, Dr. Ford. All right. Well, as program chair of this, uh, my main job now that things are happening is to try to keep us moving and make sure everyone knows where to go. And um, I like to do some quick housekeeping. Um, the bathrooms um, are down the hallway, through the double doors, make a sharp left. You'll find them there. They're not obvious. So I want to make sure everyone knows where the bathrooms are. Okay. So today, this morning, we have seven selected platform presentations um, that uh, our judges panel will jury, and we expect that those seven presentations will be completed up at about 11 o'clock, maybe a little bit after that. Once the seven um, juried presentations are complete, our judges panel will be sequestered, and they will spend some time together to decide which of these seven represents the best presentation today. It doesn't necessarily mean it had the best results. It may mean that it had the best use of quality improvement methodology, the best use of teamwork. A lot of factors go into their thinking as to what represents the best work that we will be witnessing today. Um, their judgment is final. Um, everyone, however, will receive feedback from our judges panel about their impressions of the work and possibly some ideas about how that work could be enhanced um, iteratively um, going forward. So everyone wins is my point. Um, this is a learning experience for all of us. Once we get to that 11 o'clock hour, I'm going to allow everybody to take a good break. Poster presenters will be invited to make their way up to the medical mall to begin to set up their posters, okay? Then we'll all return back here at about 11.45 Dr. Campbell will have the honor of announcing the winner for this morning's presentations. After that, everyone can make their way up to the medical mall to look at all the posters that we have to present. We have 11 of them this year, representing quite a array of our departments, which is very exciting. And many of these works are relatively new. Um, so I think our poster presenters will be not only very interested in sharing their story with you, but also getting your feedback and thoughts um, as they're trying to create their, their, um, their projects going forward. So with all that said, are there any questions? All right. Well, the very first presenter this morning is Dr. Aaron Pollack, representing the Department of Surgery. Um, and he will present to us about increasing the rate of venous thromboembolism chemoprophylaxis using the EMR. Dr. Pollack. I'm sorry, let me do this. Let me fix that for you. Did, you. did you get it? Yep. All right. All right. Um, thank you everyone for coming this morning. Uh, like stated, my name is Aaron Pollock. I am a second year surgical resident here. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank, you know, Dr. Bennett and uh, Ms. Elliott for coordinating all this and the rest of the coordinators and judges for, you know, being a part of this opportunity for me to speak today and for us to share our work as a collective whole. Um, and additionally, unfortunately, Dr. Maxwell, Dr. Miles, and Dr. Harrell, also components of this project and uh, team members here are not able to make it today, but, but that's okay. We'll proceed without them this morning. Um, so my, the goal of my project is really focused on uh, assessing and understanding the chemoprophylaxis administration at Erlinger Hospital and finding ways to improve that. Um, just as you know, background of the project as a whole, um, acute venous thromboembolism remains to be a leading cause of preventable hospital death worldwide. Uh, the incidence of VTEs in general in the United States alone occur in one out of every thousand patients, um, and the majority of which occur during or shortly after hospital admission. Uh, much of the morbidity and mortality from hospital-acquired VTEs are preventable with adoption of chemoprophylaxis guidelines. Um, those chemoprophylaxis guidelines improve uh, outcomes of VTEs by over 60%. Uh, the risk of developing a DVT in the hospital setting with appropriately prescribed medication is, uh, is anywhere between 0.5 to 2% in all patients. Um, recently, there was actually a study done out of Johns Hopkins Hospital that showed a 30% um, non-administration rate 
in all clinician prescribed DVT prophylaxis, which confirmed a national trend. And it is uh, shocking that in patients who suffered an acute VTE event, approximately 70 to 73% of those are estimated had missed at least one dose of adequately prescribed chemoprophylaxis. Um, it is for these reasons and many more that the American Heart Association had a uh, call to action to reduce VTE events by 20% by year 2030. Uh, so the problem that we've found um, here at the Erlinger Hospital was there's a disconnect between the prescribed chemoprophylaxis and its administration, and it is seen as an educational opportunity not only for patients, but also for clinical staff. Um, recent studies have shown that if patients are adequately educated on the importance of VTE prophylaxis and uh, the nursing staff are educated on the importance of VTE prophylaxis, outcomes are improved and administration rate increases. However, to do a hospital-wide teaching to not only nursing staff, but also patients for every person prescribed chemoprophylaxis, it's not cost-effective and not very efficient. Uh, the solution needs to be quick, efficient, and ineffective. Okay. So our hypothesis was that everyone uses the EMR, and if we could kind of develop a system within the EMR, we may be able to increase the uh, VTE prophylaxis administration rate. So our aim was to have a 10% increase in the rate of venous thromboembolism chemoprophylaxis administration at our institution by August, 2023. Uh, before we started to develop how the EMR could really be used in an effective manner at our hospital, we looked at all patients admitted to the hospital between the years of 2020 and 2021, including both medical and surgical patients. And we assessed um, approximately 16,000 patients uh, who received VTE prophylaxis and found that 36% of patients who were adequately prescribed the correct dosing and scheduling of VTE prophylaxis were not administered um, to our patients, which is about 6% higher than national trends. So we collected a, a multidisciplinary group of stakeholders uh, that included nursing managers, inpatient nursing staff, um, attendings, both medical and surgical attendings, clinical pharmacologists, and residents to develop a prompt and or uh, intervention that will benefit all patients. Um, what, we, what we determined was, is if we were able to make a prompt in the actual EMR for every single prescribed dose of prophylactic medication, we may be able to reach both staff um, and patients as, and address concerns regarding VT prophylaxis. So we implemented this prompt in August of last year. Um, the adage for this is in the administration instructions, it states um, all adult patients do not hold without contacting the provider. And it is seen here, um, kind of that little red circle there. Um, every single person prescribed this medication will have that listed there. Um, and the goal would be if, a, if any one of our staff wanted to withhold this medication, it would instruct them to give a page to whoever's on call, whoever that patient is admitted to, and ask them if this was an appropriate thing to hold um, prior to holding it. Um, so what we did, we implemented this and studied it after about two months, um, is from August to October. We had studied uh, 3,600 patients um, and found that our doses of missed chemoprophylaxis was about 31.6% um, compared to uh, our pre-intervention study that showed 36.1%. So effectively, we found a 4.5% increase in chemoprophylaxis in just over two months of its inception. Um, currently, we're still collecting data between um, that August timeframe and now, um, but we're still analyzing it at the moment. Um, so for right now, we're seeing a pretty good decrease in the non-administration rate and therefore an overall increase in administration and anybody prescribed uh, prophylactic doses of chemoprophylaxis. However, there are some there are some ways that we can improve this. The prompt itself is just an instruction. It just tells them what to do with the medication should they choose to withhold it. Now, if you click on that button to withhold the medication, a nurse will put in you know the reason for withholding, and then they'll find that uh, there's no prompt acknowledging that instruction. So if we can develop a hard stop that tells you know folks to please contact us, and then you acknowledge that prompt, we think that we will actually will increase that administration rate even further. Um, we have performed 
about two sessions of educational opportunities, two monthly staff meetings uh, with the nursing staff. I've done a couple for the ER. Um, we've also done some for other floors as well to just uh, instruct on the importance of this. Um, so I think if we increase that frequency, it'd definitely help. And one of the um, one of the findings we found was the reason that nurses will put into is like, this is why we withhold it was because of a MAR hold, which is an automatic withholding of all patients, medications and orders between transfer from one location to the next. And that was documented about 86% of the time for all withholding of it. So if that is a systematic thing that we can improve on, we may be able to improve our prophylactic administration just by addressing that issue alone. Um, and one of my goals is actually to stratify the findings. Uh, we just looked at every single patient admitted to the hospital, but our data sample actually includes the uh, unit the patient's admitted, admitted to, the provider it's admitted to, um, and we can then stratify that to see you know, which departments are effective, which departments are not effective, and focus educational opportunities to those groups to better uh, implement chemoprophylaxis in those populations. So that's something that is uh, to come in the future. Uh, so just by and large, so our repeat, um, our, our aim there was to decrease um, administration withholding and therefore increase administration by 10%. We were able to do it to 4.5% in just two months, um, which leaves about 5.5% improvement by 2023, which is our overall goal. Um, we are working towards that goal, and I think if we just get more patients within our study population, which we're doing currently, we'll see that number significantly increased. Um, and I believe this is an intervention that is sustainable. It's of low cost um, and a very high reward. If we can prevent VTEs in patients, it'll be uh, much beneficial not only to the cost of the patient care in the future, hospital length of stay, and morbidity and mortality for almost every patient in the hospital. Uh, barrier to progression, making a hard stop in EPIC, we found was very difficult to do. Uh, even implementing our prompt, which is just a simple administration uh, instruction, was pretty difficult. We had to go through many, many uh, people to get that in there. Uh, but to make a prompt that someone actually physically has to acknowledge, that'll take some work and something that we can do. And some unresolved issues is really um, the reason for medication withholding uh, needs to be addressed. The MAR hold statistic was not significant when our, we did our study. But again, that's only two months of study. If we increase that patient population and increase the numbers, we may be able to get that to be statistically significant um, and to have a good reason for why these things occur between our two cohorts. Um, and then still collect data to complete cycle one. We're in the middle of doing that now. Um, and once we kind of stratify that information, we'll be able to direct our educational opportunities to specific departments and then see how we can uh, increase compliance based on directed uh, educational opportunities. Uh, so in conclusion, we found that EMR prompts are very effective at increasing the rate of administration of VT chemoprophylaxis um, at our hospital system. I think it'll definitely benefit a lot of patients. Uh, here are some of my references here, and then I'll be happy to take any questions or address any concerns. Yes, ma'am. So this is mostly subjective, um, but yeah. So I've, I've actually had a couple of our um, first year residents would be like, why are they asking me about this? I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but the, <laughs> that's what they're supposed to do. Um, but they actually have been paging more frequently. And one of the confounding things that will be inherent in this study is once that, once that prompt starts happening, say the first couple months, that word of mouth will then get out saying like, oh, you make sure you, you know, you contact them. And it may not be the prompt itself, but that initial set of teaching in that group may you know, continue to spread throughout our timeline. So it has happened. Yes, we've been getting increased phone calls about this and it's great. Um, but I think a product of that may also be just word of mouth teaching between the, the units and that's the ultimate goal really. Um, um, We've actually excluded those just because in general, that was just something that was difficult for us to track as far as administration, those kinds of things. And to initiate a DOAC in a patient like in the hospital setting, that's something that's usually for prolonged, say just treatment and maintenance of an acute VTE event. 
And so we felt that that would confound some of our variables when we strictly wanted to look at prophylaxis being only the injectable stuff that we, we know that works well um, based on previous studies. Yes, sir. So there are certain surgeries where DBT is much more likely. Mm -hmm. than yes, sir. And have you looked at that in terms of the rate of withholding based on the type of surgery? Our data set is not set to assess that specifically, um, but what we are looking at is appropriately prescribed chemoprophylaxis in patients. And so what that means is anybody um, being assessed for these, if there are significant risks, say um, prolonged surgeries greater than eight hours, surgeries involving cancer, surgeries involving uh, people with comorbidities that are prothrombotic, those are the folks that are a high risk cohort and in, in, including trauma patients as well. But those who are coming in electively for like a, say, a cholecystectomy or a hernia, those kinds of folks, they are the lower risk population when it comes to surgery. So we actually don't prescribe those folks that medication. And they can get prophylaxis based on just using the comp sequential compression devices and walking. Uh, so those folks we don't really study, um, just anybody prescribed the medication. Um, but there are studies, of course, that show uh, high risk patients based on uh, surgery type but we didn't look at that specifically. The, uh, sorry, besides the Marhold, what were some of the other reasons? The most common reason that I get paged for is uh, concerns for low hemoglobin. Uh, so do you want us to hold it there? Yeah, so the highest frequency we found was Marhold. Um, the second highest was patient refused. A patient just said they didn't want it. I mean, I don't, I don't think I would want an injection to my abdomen either. Um, and then the next one from that is a, the reason being not appropriate for the patient, whether that be because the hemoglobin was low or uh, that the nurses themselves didn't feel that it was required for the patient or necessary for the patient, or a patient was ambulating or patient was pre-op. All of those were the most frequent um, comments that were found. And in the literature, there was a couple of cohorts that were studied in one single hospital setting, the ICU nurses and then floor nurses. And uh, the floor nurses, about 83% of the nurses uh, reported that they had the clinical knowledge and expertise to decide whether or not patients deserved or needed uh, chemoprophylaxis for DVTs. Um, and so that's something that we're also looking into as well as far as just the educational standpoint. Um, and I found when I was actually reviewing and studying and um, providing instructional opportunities to like the EMR or sorry, the emergency room nurses, they stated, you know, during my clinical training, during my uh, schooling, this was only a year ago from when they got out, stated, you know, patients will have a high risk of bleeding with DVT prophylaxis. Patients will, you know, with low hemoglobin need to have this withheld. And we know that there's no increased risk of bleeding with solid organ injury um, or someone with a low hemoglobin. There's no increased risk of bleeding with chemoprophylaxis. So it's something that is currently evolving as far as like reaching out to the, the nurses. Um, education and even our own education. I mean, I was taught the same thing. So it's just kind of flipping the script on, you know, what we should be doing as far as uh, DVT prophylaxis. Yes, ma'am. So you mentioned that um, Marhold is the biggest reason, like 85% of why the medications aren't administered. What does that look like to the nurses when the Marhold happens? And for example, do they get a prompt to say these medications were missed? Um, and is there a way to trigger a message that says contact provider or something? If this medication, you know, like it doesn't seem like they're making the choice to hold it. They could easily just overlook it. So um, I have not looked at that specifically, but systematically, as far as what we receive, as far as pages and concerns from there, if a medication is due, it'll show up on their, on their uh, scheduling of medications, but they won't be able to physically get that out of the Pixis to provide that medication because it's on a, a more hold. And in order for that to be withheld, they have to contact the provider to unhold it. Now, historically, uh, nursing uh, staff were able to release the MAR, uh, but it's been over recent years that they have turned that back and make it clinician responsibility to review the orders and make sure that orders are appropriate for the patient. But on our end, at least personally, I don't ever see when it becomes withheld. There's no prompt for me to see that the patient's stuff is withheld. So when they get to the floor, uh, sometimes it's automatically unheld and sometimes it's not. And it's up to staff to really let us know. Uh, so unfortunately, that answer is not. I'll have to make that the last question. Uh, uh, one of the least enjoyable parts of my job is keeping things on time. But thank you, Dr. Pollack. That was a great presentation. Thank you, officer. All right. All right. 
I failed to mention early on the time regulations for our speakers, uh, they have 12 minutes to speak and I'll be sort of keeping time up front and, and I'll signal um, with there's about a minute to go. You probably just see me wave like a like a crazy person. Um, and then there's five minutes for Q&A. So that'll give us everybody about 17 minutes uh, total for, for each presentation. So I apologize for not saying that up front. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Benjamin Wellborn representing the Department of Orthopedics and Dr. Wellborn will be presenting on multimodal perioperative pain regimen for posterior fusion in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Dr. Wellborn. Hey, yeah, thank you. Uh, the presentation should be right down, just hover, hover over it and you grab it there. F5 into your presentation. All right. So I'm actually Charlie Powell. Dr. Wellborn is out on vacation My this apology. week. No problem. Um, I responded to an email late about it. Um, thank you all for having this today. There seems to be countless things that I come across that I think we could do better, specifically in the orthopedic department. Um, but for today, we're focusing on the Multimodal perioperative pain regimen for posterior fusion in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So just for some background, um, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis or AIS uh, can be thought of as a coronal plane deformity or the frontal plane. It's in patients 10 to 18 years old and is the most common type. Um, once you get to a higher degree of curvature, which you can see on the right side of the screen, um, it tends to have a female predominance. And then for select patients, if it gets above uh, the 45 degrees, it becomes operative. So what is that operation? Well, it's a posterior spinal instrumented fusion. So as you can see here on this picture, it's an extensile exposure. Um, we then place pedicle screws within bone and then do a large curve correction with rods. So ultimately all this leads together to produce a lot of pain. So the first literature came out about this pain control problem in 1989. Um, and the exact details aren't uh, essential here, but what you can see is from 90s up until about 2008, uh, opiates were the primary method of controlling this pain. From 2008 on up until 2016, they started incorporating other modalities to control pain. Um, and then in 2016, the rapid recovery pathway with multimodal analgesia uh, was coined and has since kind of been the uh, standard of care following surgery. So on the right side of the screen is the uh, multimodal pain control that we currently use. The exact details aren't very important here, but uh, what's important is you can see how complex it is. It's a ton of different medications at a ton of different timings. Um, so here at Erlanger, we're doing at least, at least on the pediatric service, one posterior spinal fusion per week. Um, and then before we uh, went through this project, patients would go to the floor or the ICU, just depending on how they did throughout surgery. Um, so just kind of off standard um, comorbidities, respiratory status, stuff like that. What we found is the patients that went to the floor had uh, increased length of stay and the nursing staff and the pediatric team that we got involved with their post-operative care uh, found that maintaining this new pathway that we uh, developed to be tough to carry out. So that led to inconsistency of medication administration, variability in pain control and an average length of stay of four days. So the aim of our project was to improve the consistency of implementation of the protocol, decrease MMEs, decrease length of stay, and ultimately increasing satisfaction of the patient, family, uh, nursing staff, and physicians. So here's a fishbone diagram. Um, so some of the things that really come into this are uh, the patient is an adolescent. Pain control in kids is just a tough thing by nature. Some are very stoic. Some are the opposite of that. Uh, for the surgeon, it's again, it's a large exposure. It's a large correction. Um, we have time constraints to where we're in the OR and we can't be monitoring the uh, log of what medications a patient receives during that time. Um, 
then the ORP, the protocol, again, is extensive. It runs on a strict schedule. And then I think the biggest thing is the environment. Um, so on the floor, the nursing to patient ratio is much higher, uh, much lower than it is in the ICU. Some of these floor staff are not as comfortable with some of the medications we order, um, and then they don't have advanced monitoring te uh, technologies on the floor. It's all leading to uncontrolled pain, high MMEs, and prolonged length of stay. So here are measures. We'll get to those um, a little bit later. Um, essentially, the things I already said, length of stay, MMEs, um, patient mobility is another big one. They have to get mobile with physical therapy before they can get home. Um, so we did three PDSA cycles. So our first one was implementing the new multimodal pain management program. We did this from August to September, so over one month. Uh, so we initiated in August, and then we quickly had the pediatric team complaining of difficulty with managing the protocol. Um, so inconsistency of the floor versus the ICU. So our act on this was to admit all patients to the ICU postoperatively. From September to December, we assessed this, um, and we got positive subjective feedback, um, decreasing MMEs, earlier mobilization, Decreased time to discharge. Uh, however, this was carried out on, in a small sample size um, over this time. So our third cycle was to continue it for over a year, um, do a retrospective analysis on two cohorts um, and confirm significance between the two cohorts. So that's what we did from December of 2020 to December of 2021 with continued postoperative ICU admission. Uh, we found statistically significant decrease in length of stay and MMEs. Um, with the current plan to continue to monitor um, how these patients do postoperatively and do some uh, subset analysis. So here's a graph uh, showing the decrease in MMEs with the light blue representing the uh, experimental group. Um, so 56 patients in total, 21 underwent the pathway. MME requirements significantly decreased with a mean difference of 60. And then length of stay uh, also statistically significantly decreased from three to, uh, from four to three days. So discussion, um, this pathway can reduce MMEs and length of stay following posterior spinal fusion. Uh, it is a complex protocol and it requires open communication with staff, um, having staff ability to execute and then just having the time to uh, declare the ability and validity of the protocol. So barriers and lessons learned, communication with staff. I know it's, it's tough to do that. Sometimes we're in the OR and, and not immediately available. Uh, important to listen to your patients and families so you can find uh, a problem if there is one. Um, using multimodal pain regimens is good if you can do it. Um, and then a big one is putting in the orders doesn't ensure execution. So be diligent, just like we talked about in that last one. Just because you ordered Lovenox, apparently 30% of the time it doesn't get given. So following up, checking the MAR, making sure it, it got delivered is important. Um, so next steps, continue to apply the pathway um, and then see where else we can apply it um, to control postoperative pain and, and get these people out of here as, as quickly as they can. Um, and then subset analysis again. So here are references and I'll take any questions if you have. I'm just curious, um, for all the different adolescents that you do, do you have different pathways for like a normal child versus a medically complex child where there may be other medications that can be complicating everything, uh, say a kid that's very spastic and is on a good amount of baclofen or anything like that. Right, right. Yeah, we, we definitely do. Um, and we do those cases a lot as well. This study just focused on AIS, so idiopathic, so not having any of those neurological uh, problems at baseline, but we routinely send those uh, like an SMA kid to the ICU and they fall in this pathway as well. So uh, any posterior final, spinal fusion like that is going to the ICU now. I was, it's amazing how much data you have, but I was just curious, um, 
especially thinking about like this is something you could probably publish. Have has anyone considered doing a cost analysis of the length of stay and then the ICU admission? Uh, we have not yet, but that would be a fantastic idea to do that. We can do another cycle and uh, assess that. I will say that most patients uh, do get out of the ICU on post-op uh, day one. Um, and we had a fusion this week uh, and the guy went home on post-op day two. So he was out of the ICU post-op day one to the floor post-op day two and to home. So it seems to be getting better and better as we go. Awesome, I'm, I wanted to ask you about um, in the context of staff discomfort or difficulty, what did you learn? What was driving that discomfort and difficulty um, on the floor staff level or, or other parties? Yeah, it was primarily due to time constraints and keeping up with the scheduled medications, uh, particularly when the nursing to uh, patient ratio wasn't good. So they were taking care of other kids and unable to meet that deadline to give that scheduled tort off, for example. And now that kids are coming out of the ICU relatively fast on this um, model, are you running into similar barriers with continuation of the multimodal pain strategy, or is it largely over by the time they leave the ICU? Yeah, largely over. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job, Dr. Powell. All right. We're a little ahead of schedule, which is comforting to me. Um, and if, uh, if we stay ahead and people would like it, we may take a brief bio break somewhere in the middle of the presentations um, if, if people would like that. Um, our next presenter uh, represents the Department of Family Medicine. Um, and uh, we have Dr. Uh, Ryan Shibata and Dr. Andrew De Jesus uh, presenting to us about improving blood pressure control in a family medicine residency clinic by engaging social determinants of health and utilizing outpatient clinical pharmacists. Um, here we are. Just hit F5. F5. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Yeah, Good. I think so. And uh, to move, like so. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew De Jesus. I am a medical student. This is Ryan Chivata. He is a third year family medicine resident. We're going to talk to you about improving blood pressure in our family medicine clinic by addressing two things social determinants of health and our clinical pharmacists. So, whoop, here we are. So we have no disclosures. We started this project in October of 2020, planned to finish by 2025. Why did we start the project in the first place? So in 2019, our county came out with some really startling statistics about the health disparities between white and black in our population. Most notable to us was that in the black population here in our county, four times more likely to die of hypertensive related illnesses, 30% more likely to die of heart disease and 35% more likely to have stroke. These, these were completely startling to us and it made us think, what, what are we doing to help? And as we looked at our own practice, we saw some gaps of our own. Among our own patients, only about 35 to 40% were controlled with a blood pressure below 140 over 90. This is slightly below national average of 40, uh, 45 to 53%. So we thought, what can we do to fix this, this, own, this gap in our own um, clinic? So we came up with our AIM statement back in 2020, uh, 21, and it was that by March 31st of this year, 50% of the patients enrolled in our trial would be controlled to their gold blood pressure at two consecutive visits. 
That's what we set out to do. So how are we going to measure it? Measure it simply. We basically put the number of patients with controlled blood pressure over the total number of patients in each cohort. Our process measures, we reviewed the data quarterly to see if we were accomplishing our goal. And balancing measures, things that we had to take into account was how is our focus on hypertension affecting patient satisfaction with their visits? How is it affecting our physician satisfaction? And are we inadvertently worsening other comorbidities? So we created our fishbone diagram to try and address this quality gap in our clinic. And we came up with a lot of things, but we decided to focus on two. The impact of social determinants of health on our patients, making it to their visits, and also the incredible resource that we have in our PG-1 pharmacy residents at our clinic. How can we use them to help? So we created our, our definitions and our flow chart. And what we did was this. If we identified a patient with hypertension, so blood pressure above 130 over 80 at two visits, we did one of two things. If we had a social work intern at our clinic that day, we would warm transfer that patient to the intern uh, the social worker would gather their social determinants of health information and work with them to make it to their visits. If an intern wasn't there, we would leave them an, an epic uh, message and they would still call that patient, get the same amount of info and help them get to their appointments. Now, we involved the pharmacist in this way. We had those patients with hypertension meet with their physician and then two months later, a pharmacist. Two months later, a physician and a pharmacist both of them looking at the medications, trying to optimize management. Now, when that patient had blood pressure control for two consecutive visits, they would graduate, so to speak, to three-month follow-up. Physician, pharmacist, physician, pharmacist. And when there was two consecutive visits of control on that regimen, they graduated to six months. And this is how we see it set out to improve our hypertension management. Thank you, Andrew. And so all last year, at the start of the program, start of the project, we completed multiple PDSA cycles. However, we didn't quite understand fully how to do quality improvement projects. And we implemented simultaneously three, four, five different PDSA cycles at the same time. We didn't quite follow the data as well to see which one gave us the most improvement. Nonetheless, we did them. We handed out patient, patient flyers to improve patient education. We put up hallway, uh, reminders showing how the project is working, how people's blood pressures are being controlled. Uh, we even put up uh, clinical room reminders for the physician to see and the patients to read while they're waiting. However, this year, as we learned more and more how to perform quality improvement projects, we decided just to focus on one single problem. And so by looking at the data, one problem was clear to us this year. You can see here, these blue stars represent the previous PDSA cycles. The graphs there, the black lines, the tan the gray lines show the number of people enrolled in the project for that month. This orange line shows the cumulative enrollment total throughout the time. And as you can see that over time, our physician enrollment number was decreasing. And this was a huge problem for us because we know that this project works and yet we were failing to capture these patients. We had three consecutive months where we didn't have any physician referrals and even some people had left the program. So for the 2022 PDSA cycle, we decided to make one announcement at the UTFP clinical didactic session, re-engage our physicians and our residents and enrolling people into the program. We showed them the data, we showed them that it worked and then we stepped back and we didn't make any other changes. There were no daily reminders. There were no rotunda announcements. There were no physician, I mean, patient handouts at the door. And what we saw was that after one month, we got six referrals. So after three consecutive months of no referrals with one single intervention, it led us to getting six referrals placed. Furthermore, it just shows us that caregiver awareness will definitely improve outcomes. This led us to make our act plan of this year's PDSA cycle. So moving forward next year, the goal is to have multiple residents perform a PDSA cycle each quarter and then have a third year resident oversee the project or that we can ensure that our measuring or balancing measures are completed and to refocus our efforts as we move forward each year. That red star that you can see is just the difference 
from the previous slide. Six referrals were made, five people accepted the program and one declined. But already you can see the change with one single focused intervention. Overall, we did not meet our aim. Shortly shy of it, 49.3% of the people enrolled in this project have blood pressures that are controlled at their personal goals. However, what I'd like to point out, you can see here the first, the second, the third, and the fourth cohort, the longer the people are in the program, the more likely they have their blood pressure controlled. You can see here in our first cohort, the first people that have started the program, they're in it the longest, we're well above the national average and well above our previous average. And mind you again, all the people enrolled at this program had 0% blood pressure control in the beginning. And now in our first cohort, we have 59%. So you can see that the longer the people are in the program, eventually we believe that they'll get there. Overall, we're decreasing blood pressures by 13 over eight points. And just to comment on our social determinants, of health outcomes, we were able to decrease the absolute risk reduction in food insecurities, housing insecurities. However, when analyzing this data, this didn't necessarily correlate to improve blood pressure control. Then as well, we looked at the number of physician visits versus the number of pharmacy visits. And same thing there, we couldn't correlate one single magical number that would lead to improved blood pressure control. However, we know if they're in the program and they're bouncing back and forth, according to our flow diagram, with time, their blood pressures will get controlled. Furthermore, what we learn from the project, what we'll learn each year moving forward, understanding how to do a quality improvement project is essential to this process. We know that this hypertension project works, it's just not clear why yet. And we can consider, we're having discussions currently on what to do about the social determinants of health screening and monitoring. We do believe the screening is a good thing, but whether or not we can keep monitoring this data or should be monitoring the data is something we're talking about. And most importantly, we've come to see that a multidisciplinary approach to managing blood pressure is vital to obtaining this quality goal. It couldn't be done without our social workers, our pharmacists, our medical students. Next. We're just looking forward to implementing the ACT plan of the 2020 PDSA cycle. And some barriers that we had run into, at times patient compliance uh, could be an issue. We realized that resident culture is also a barrier. The initial class that started this project and was carrying that initial momentum had graduated and around that same time, the trend of enrolling people started to decrease. New interns had come in and it requires onboarding and by buying into this idea that controlling blood pressure is not just something we do, but it's something that we are. COVID had interfered with our uh, compliance with appointments. Not everybody had a home blood pressure and cuff that we can monitor their blood pressures over telemedicine visits. And then as well, key stakeholders. Uh, we had different role changes throughout this time. Our quality oversight coach had changed roles or EPIC lead analyst had changed roles. Um, it took a little bit longer to extract data from EPIC during this time. Some references, and then most importantly, some thank yous to the past team members, our current team members. And as you can see, it's just too great to list numerous social workers and clinical pharmacists that have aided us along the way. We open for any questions. Or when Oh, was there a regimen plan for when someone was deemed to have resistant hypertension on four yeah. medications and would a referral take them out of the program? Yeah. No, so they would stay in the program and that, that kind of played into the idea of why we couldn't find a single magical number. Somebody would come in, have one visit, need one medication, get it controlled. Others would need two, three, four visits and then realize they have resistant hypertension. They're still in the program but it would be worked up as resistant hypertension. We continue to see them. Um, so they didn't switch pathways. They're still in the program. And it's something that is addressed at our pharmacy visits, along with other confounding factors, alcohol use, OSA, smoking, things like that. Yep. Um, first, thanks for um, involving a medical student. We need to do a lot more of that. Um, you touched on this very briefly, but as you well know, 
there's a significant number of people who have white coat syndrome and they have very elevated blood pressure in the doctor's office, but not at home. Now, how are you monitoring that? Is that, yeah. How, that, how, do you have the resources to do that? We do. So we do have the resources. They are limited. And the way we do that, we, we check them out with home blood pressure cuffs that are uh, standardized across the, the program. And then we review home blood pressure logs and we go by that. If that is the diagnosis, um, then we go by home blood pressure measurements. And, and what's the time frame over time? How long do you do that? Oh, so it, so they will be in the program and there, there's no time frame in terms of they'll stay in it. And if that becomes evident, that is the diagnosis, whether that's within two visits, one visit, it should happen relatively quick because if they don't have a blood pressure monitor or pharmacy visit, that's one of the first things that they do. And on the pharmacy notes, there's a section that exactly shows home blood pressure log review. So it should happen relatively quick, but they're still in the program. Um, but as far as being controlled, uncontrolled, they can quickly be controlled. Great project, thank you. Question in the back, doctor. Um, thank you for the great presentation. Um, this is a quick question. So, um, reminders, uh, you know, during the uh, different periods is definitely very important to get everyone, you know, excited again and to do the project. And I saw on your graph that back in like about August 2021, there was actually a fall off in recruitment as well. Um, did you determine um, why that occurred then? And was there anything implemented then to improve your recruitment going forward? Yeah. So we didn't look specifically at that month. Um, we are aware of the, the variations, thoughts in our minds and something that we know is a barrier is that currently our social work interns that are with us that are a key integral part of our flow chart, they have their academic breaks as well. So there are months where we have no social worker. Um, there is some question about how to overcome this. Uh, some residents were not making any referrals during that time thinking that they're not here, the project's on hold. Uh, other residents were still sending messages and it was just something that be, would be backlogged. Um, so moving forward, if somebody was to take this same project and implement it themselves in their own clinic, that would be vital to have social work 24 seven on board, but it's definitely a confounding factor on that referrals uh, data. We don't always have our social work intern. And so a key process in our flow chart just kind of gets logged. Yes. Um, I was curious, just kind of theoretically with the concept that you have a clinic with kind of the max amount, amount of patients um, and that at some point, if you enroll these patients and they stay in it um, forever, that you'd kind of max out on enrollments, I guess, or that you would kind of anticipate that the number of enrollments would go down as you're including everyone with hypertension. Have you considered that aspect? Yeah, no, it's definitely, that would be a great goal if we could get everybody enrolled and everybody controlled and graduated from the program. And the, the main issue is actually enrolling patients. Sometimes that, that we're not, people don't want to join the study. So there are still a handful of people that are not enrolled in the project that have uncontrolled blood pressure and just don't want to be involved. Um, currently, there's 117 people enrolled in the project. And so if you imagine the number of patients we see who have hypertension, who are uncontrolled, those people are just not captured, so by, but by choice. Um, but yes, that's true. At some point we will run out of room if everybody was enrolled. Uh, to try and decrease barriers to enrollment, these pharmacy and social work visits have zero copay, zero cost to the patient, um, which I also just wanted to make that known. Shavada and uh, student Dr. De Jesus, who, by the way, is wearing the best tie at the show. Anyway, okay, <clears throat> we are we are rolling right along. Um, our next presenter is from the Department of Internal Medicine. Dr. Tanner Bond will present on diabetic kidney disease screening.
on the computer. So. All right. So thanks everyone for coming out. Um, I wanted to discuss to you today about an exciting project that I've, has been in the works for the last year. I'm Tanner Bond. I'm one of the second year internal medicine residents, and I think it will come as no surprise that I'll be trying to get into nephrology coming next year uh, by the end of this presentation. I did want to thank some of the team members that we have, namely myself. There's Michael Cataldo, who's also presenting, or not Michael Cataldo, Victor Kremser, Alyssa Farrell, and then a faculty mentor, Dr. Nicholas Pomelia, who's helping out with the project. He's the outpatient coordinator. Did want to talk about at least the physiology of diabetic kidney disease, diabetes, excessively high sugars in the bloodstream, and this actually will lead to lots of downstream effects that are not apparent at the beginning. You will end up having a lot of foot uh, and hand nerve damage. You will end up getting diabetic eye disease. And what we are predominantly going to talk about today is diabetic kidney disease. Um, this works by a myriad of factors that leads to deposition in the kidneys themselves, and you end up losing protein that are vital to your body's function. Uh, diabetes also is the leading cause of death in the U.S., um, among other factors, and leads to heart disease and stroke being a large contribution. And 44% of end-stage kidney disease can be attributed to diabetes. And if intervened on early enough, control of diabetic kidney disease could stave off some of these potential harmful effects of heart attack, strokes, and DSKD, and being dialysis dependent. Luckily, there are some new exciting interventions, um, namely SGLT2 inhibitors, which the cardiologists are also very excited about that can be utilized in this manner. The problem that we have found is that appropriate screening for diabetic kidney disease is lacking across the United States. Um, the American Diabetes Association recommends that a urine albumin to creatinine ratio be checked along with renal function once yearly in type 1 and type 2 diabetics, type 2 diabetics being at disease onset and type 1 being five years after. Adequate screening rates across the U.S. is suboptimal, and typically only about 43% of patients yearly are screened appropriately. And because we are missing many patients, there are inevitably going to be patients that progress without us even knowing and eventually come to our doorstep with a creatinine of 7 and are uremic, requiring urgent dialysis. The primary aims of our project was to be able to see what the deficiency in our own clinic was, being that, Di that the Dodson Avenue Clinic is a university or is a federally qualified healthcare center for destitute patients across the region. And we wanted to be able to see how we could improve that. We wanted to see what the barriers were for this screening, and we wanted to in increase the compliance, given a couple measures that we'll discuss in a couple of minutes here. First, for the data collection process, we decided to uh, be able to screen patients for an academic year from July 1 of one year to June of the next, being that that's the resident cycle and it's typically the providers that we find is the biggest barrier to actually getting this done appropriately. We then selected all of the diabetic patients across our clinic and found that there are 422 that are seen yearly in the clinic. Only 54 of them had a pot had any testing appropriate whatsoever. This is 12.8%. Um, and of those 54, 24 were positive. What we wanted to do was figure out why that is. Uh, some of the biggest reasons why we found was lack of knowledge. We sent a survey monkey out to the residents um, several months ago that was multiple choice and half of the residents could not select the correct test when given it on multiple choice for diabetic kidney disease. Not only that, but there was apprehension regarding testing, regarding what do I even do with this test? How do I find it on Epic? Um, other problems that we found was that there's a care gap section on Epic itself that tells you you need to screen for diabetic kidney disease. Unfortunately, it's written as urine microalbumin. If you don't know what that is, why are you gonna order it? Also, uh, that test could be resolved with inappropriate testing, such as a simple urinalysis or just spot urine albumin, neither of which are going to guide your management, really. Uh, we also found that some other things that would be an issue would the patient would urinate shortly before their visit, they wouldn't be able to provide a sample or the sample they would provide just wasn't adequate for appropriate testing. So we decided to to tackle the top three problems that we found were at least able to be addressed. Uh, primarily, we decided to educate the residents. We found that that being the most significant factor. The residents do have every five weeks when they are in clinic on a Wednesday afternoon, 
a teaching session with our outpatient director, Dr. Familia, uh, where we utilized the Yale office-based medicine curriculum and we implemented a diabetic kidney disease lecture there. Uh, we also altered the clinic templates to make sure that the residents always have a reminder to address this care gap and every other care gap that is necessary for cancer screening and diabetic screening. We also changed, we worked with the IT department, Aaron Oliver, to ensure that the correct test was actually ordered and was, would resolve the care gap appropriately. This is the title of that Yale office-based medicine. Some of the objectives we found were very important was to address the microvascular complications and understand the mechanism and how to order it appropriately and how often to what order to test and actually how to use that test as well. Um, this, I couldn't help myself before the initiation of the project. I spoke with many residents all the time about order this, order that, and I routinely get questions about, hey, I have this test, what do I do with it now? And we're able to address those. We also, implemented a nice little healthcare maintenance at the end of every note. This is not comprehensive, but it does show just a piece of it where it will actually show at the end of your note, all of your care gaps, when it was done and when it needs to be done next. Unfortunately, this patient has not had much done and it becomes easy at the end of the, your note to say, I need to fix this. So we wanted to make sure that it was intrinsic that the residents said, I want to be able to fix this instead of just putting a stop gap and causing more pop-up fatigue on your orders. Speaking of the orders, we tried to make it easier for them to order the correct test. Under the care gaps on the bottom left, this is a typical outpatient uh, EPIC summary. It's a little busy, but I tried to highlight the important pieces. You can actually now click under the care gaps where it says you're in microalbumin, click it, and it will automatically select the correct test being the microalbumin creatinine ratio to be done at that visit. Some of our data that we collected the year after being starting uh, July 1st, 2021, we noted that approximately 447 patients were screened and we were able to appropriately screen 163 of them compared to 54 in the previous year. Um, not only were we able to select a lot of positive patients, but we had 164% increased rate of screening over one year. Um, we are still missing a significant number of patients, but that certainly did meet our goal of doubling our current rating of screening. What we wanted to do then was say, okay, this is how our clinic is doing. We're approaching the national average. We're at 36%, the average being about 40. How is the rest of your own your system doing? Some of it was great, some of it not so great. Um, the Erlanger system as a whole is this dark blue line as indicated on the lower side where across the Erlanger system, we screen about 10% of patients adequately across the entire system. That's several tens of thousands of diabetic patients. Uh, the AIM clinic is actually doing quite well. That's the one here in the medical mall. They screen about 50% of patients yearly. Um, and our clinic in the gray and UT family practice has also been increasing. And I've discussed with them that this has been a, a major talking point, talking with Charles Millard. Um, let's see here. What I wanted to move on to next is what are our next steps? We've now been able to uh, plan. We've done what we wanted to do and we've studied it. And we've essentially said, we still have critical deficiencies. Where do we go from here? I think one of the biggest things is continuing the education and implementing this uh, knowledge about appropriate screening next year. We have new interns coming in July. I hope that the third years that are graduating continue this practice and they're on their own, but this presents an opportunity to be able to catch patients far earlier than we typically would. We also do want to change how the care gaps pops up in EPIC instead of year, saying you're in microalbumin, it says diabetic kidney disease. You click it, selects the correct test, and you move on, it's easy. Um, and we think that those are going to be the most important things. Of course, 37% is better, but it's not good or anywhere near where you want it to be. What I wanted to just give a thanks to everyone that helped out with this project, Dr. Camellia, primarily, he's running that clinic. It's his baby, and we want to make sure that he can do everything he can to get it better. Dr. McCart is our quality improvement supervisor. Oliver Aaron has been fantastic in assisting us with our epic navigation and being able to actually make significant changes. And I just wanted to thank all the residents for actually taking the time out of their busy clinic schedules to implement just one more thing that they have to do at their clinic visits, which I know is a big ask. And I wanted to thank all the nursing staff at Dodson Avenue Clinic. 
though we have high turnover, the ones that we do get are helpful and want to actually make a difference. So I wanted to see if any of y'all had any questions for me. Yeah. Sure. Uh, here. Yeah. And you probably don't have this data, but it might be nice to know uh, what level of support staff at each of those clinics have to produce those results, just FYI. Might yeah, be a great I, project in the future. Yeah, and I think that's something that can be handled appropriately as well, because one of the big things that I wanted to do in the clinic was say, let's just have the nursing staff just collect a urine sample before the visit, so the urine is there and we're ready to go, and we get it once a year. But I found that every five weeks we had a new medical assistant that I had to teach this to. And just the continuity of that education became very, very difficult. Yes. Um, this is um, a really good idea with the care gap. So I just want to kind of find out um, how you worked with the IT team and how you made sure that the care gaps were being um, it was being listed only appropriate people. For instance, does everyone, you made, everyone is definitely documented with type one or type two diabetes and then the proper timing is listed or do you still have to make sure everyone's following up and make sure that the care gap is actually showing up on time or it's being done sort of thing? That has been an issue. Um, at some points you'll have a patient that is listed as previously diabetic, but is now nutritionally controlled. They're pre-diabetic at 5.7 and after discussing with IT, it just turned out that that problem hadn't been marked as resolved by a provider yet, um, where they were now in the pre-diabetic range, but did not further require that screening. Um, and we found that it's been quite consistent that once that year mark hits, it will flag again and say, this needs to be checked. But as problems come up, we address it with Oliver and he is very quick to fix them. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. I appreciate it. All right. Okay. Our next speaker, uh, also from the Department of Internal Medicine, is Dr. Michael Cataldo, and he will present to us on the significance of micropuncture use in vascular access with cardiac <laughs> catheterization. All right, well, thank you all so much for having us here at Crips Day 2022. I'm Michael Cataldo. I'll be presenting significance of micropuncture use and vascular access with cardiac catheterization. And before I begin, I really want to give a quick shout out to my co-resident, um, Harka Yadav. She really spearheaded this project, um, but unfortunately couldn't be here today. She is currently in uh, Poland assisting Ukrainian refugees. So to start, I want you to picture a patient coming into the hospital. He is a 60-year-old male. He's overweight, enjoys his fried chicken, and he is complaining of sharp pain in the middle of his chest. We do an EKG, which shows uh, electrical changes in the heart. The troponin is elevated. This is a cardiac enzyme, which is a marker of heart damage. And we look at this patient and we say, he's having a heart attack. So we rush him down to the cath lab where a needle is inserted into either the radial artery in the wrist or the femoral artery on the inside of the thigh, through which a small wire is then inserted, and then a small hollow tube, the catheter, is then threaded over up through the arm and to the heart, where contrast dye is now injected, allowing us to visualize the blood vessels that surround the heart. And in this patient, like many others, we'll probably be able to see areas in the blood vessels that are narrowed, or maybe obstructed entirely. Um, interventionalists in the procedure can go ahead and place stents that can go ahead and open up these blockages, or in cases of severe disease, these patients can also be referred to cardiothoracic surgery for bypass grafts. 
So heart catheterizations are an immensely common procedure performed all across the United States. There's about a million done per year with a relatively low complication rate. It's less than 1% um, across all patients. However, when complications do occur, they are very severe and potentially life-threatening. So the most common are listed here, major bleeding, hematomas, pseudoaneurysms, AV fistulas, et cetera. So micropuncture, what I'm here to discuss today specifically, is talking about that initial needle, which is used to gain access to the artery. So our standard needle is going to be the 18 gauge. The micropuncture needle, which was originally introduced about 10 years ago, 21 gauge is about 56% smaller. Since that time, really within the last five years, there's a handful of studies that have come out um, that are mixed to positive in terms of their review. They're all relatively small and single center studies. So the uh, so SCI, the Society for Cardiovascular Angiography Intervention, has suggested the use of micropuncture, but it is not yet a requirement. So here at Erlanger, we currently have no recommendations or guidance when it comes to use of micropuncture. So currently it is interventionalist um, specific and at their discretion when or if it gets used. So our proposal is to come up with a set of guidelines to help guide our interventionalists on when micropuncture will be appropriate in order to improve our patient outcomes. So for a general patient that is going to go through catheterization and has a complication, you know, the most common being things like pseudoaneurysm or bleeding, um, this results in a number of consequences. So this is going to extend their hospital stay, um, requires pain medication, imaging, blood products, um, and even in certain situations, we have to involve vascular surgery for correction. All of those things are a major burden on the patient, on their health. These things are going to increase the costs of, that the hospital has to now expend on each of these patients. And it, it deteriorates the trust between the you know, patient provider relationship. So what we started with is a retrospective cohort study um, these are patients collected out of the EPIC system. They're patients that received catheterization from January 2018 to January 2020. Um, we specifically whittled that down to patients that only got radial or femoral access, which are the most common, and then divided them into patients that received the standard needle versus the micropuncture needle. And we looked at these patients across several demographics, really being um, gender, age, BMI, and their site of access. So this is looking at some of our initial data. You can see furthest on the left here is our total numbers, um, which I think was better reflected when we divided based on femoral or radial access. Um, it's long been established in the literature that femoral access has a much higher rate of complications than does radial access, so that wasn't a surprise. But you can see the rate of complications in standard versus micropuncture, specifically in the middle there for femoral access, had a major significant difference in the rate of complication that was important. So across all of the categories that we studied, so from, for femoral access, age 40 to 80, BMI greater than 30, and really women over men, all had a key value less than 0.05 and all came back as significant for having lower rates of complication when micropuncture was used in these groups versus the standard needle. Um, and just to drive home this point a little bit more, I think this uh, really gives a nice vis visualization these don't include p-values because we actually calculate those p-values across each of these age and BMI groups, but I think it gives you a nice visualization, visual, visualization of, our, um, of our data. So looking at age here on the right, um, you know, we really looked at ages 40 to 80. Um, you can see that the um, standard group actually had a lower complication rate than those who are 80 and older, and these are already our highest, um, highest with patients to begin with. And then over on the left is our BMI. Um, you can see across actually all, um, all sizes, um, there was a lower rate of complication with our micropuncture group. However, it was most significant for those who have a BMI greater than 30, so patients who are obese. So we did our study in well, what will be three phases. So this first phase is this retrospective cohort study that I've been talking about right now, um, this collection of data and data processing that we've done now to create new guidelines or a standardization that can be used here in the hospital. And that is leading us now into what is our current and ongoing second phase. So taking those guidelines, 
and using them for provider education. So um, this is an example of the guidelines that we have now established. So that's for BMI greater than 30 in women and age uh, 40 to 80 and for moral access. These are all recommendations and a new guideline for when micropuncture should be chosen in the lab over the standardized needle. Um, so far, these have been posted both in the cardiology fellows office, um, in most of the catheterization labs now, um, and we are currently undergoing education for physicians, for fellows, for scrub techs, and all other members of the teams that are involved in catheterization. Um, and so for our future goals, um, you know, as we track um, the use of micropuncture in these new variants over time, we're gonna be looking for increasing compliance with this specific population, but also really looking at to see if we can reduce our overall rates of catheter complications here at Erlanger Hospital. Um, we're also considering introducing um, other metrics such as changes in length of hospital stay or uh, changes in cost of stay. Um, we do have certain barriers and limitations. This is, of course, a very small study. It is single center. And, you know, we do have a very special population here at Erlanger Hospital, and it does make it difficult to extrapolate to other institutions. Um, some of the other barriers that we're encountering is really going to be based around physician compliance. So the use of a micropuncture needle is um, it's smaller than the traditional needle, which means that it is difficult or more difficult to visualize on imaging. Um, in addition, it does require an extra step. Um, after the needle is placed, the wire is threaded, and then it needs a micropuncture catheter, which then has to be sized up to a standardized catheter. So this does involve a extra step, which can be slightly more tedious, and it does add a very small amount of time to the overall procedure. So, Given all the data that I've just provided you, you know, we strongly recommend the use of micropuncture um, in this very specific population. So again, for our BMIs over 30, age 40 to 80 um, in women. And we think that over time with increasing patient or excuse me, increasing provider education, we can lead to a significant decrease in the rates of complication here at Erlanger, our length of stay, as well as the cost of care that we're providing for patients. Um, I want to give some special thanks to Harak Yadav, which I already did, to um, John Austin Ash and Savathi Santi, who actually began this project um, way back in 2020, and we picked back up again, um, to our cardiology fellows, Mark Erickson and Joseph Henley, who've been importantly involved in education, and Erickson did a lot of favors for us when it came to data processing, and to our um, supervisor, Dr. Kulu. Uh, thank you, and uh, any questions? Um, I was just curious for the micropuncture, you mentioned that one of the barriers is that it's more difficult to do and or visualize. Um, is there a difference on with those limitations between higher BMI patients and lower BMI patients? You know, I, I don't know the real answer to that. Um, you know, when we're looking at BMI, I think that the overall problem with those is going to be visualization. It really comes to, you know, actually visualizing markers for where the needle is inserted. So I think that if I were to take those as a group, they would probably overall have more complications than the average patient. Um, and that's why we want to introduce these kinds of new recommendations, because if, you know, and then we can reduce those rates of complications, especially for the really high risk patients, then we're doing the most benefit. It, it, are there any, are Thank there you. any, um, I was saying this just seems hugely important and I was wondering if there were any thoughts about getting funding or, or trying to do a multi-institutional study. I mean, I, I would love that. I think that right now it's still a little bit too early. And, you know, I think one of the, the real reasons you know, why micropuncture is where it is right now is that it's still relatively new, you know, 10 years in, in medicine years is not very old. Um, and hopefully, you know, as more studies come out over time, it'll get to the point where we can have larger studies and make it a definitive recommendation. Besides some of the providers hesitancy to be able to use this, is it just because it's new or is it truly just because they believe it's more difficult? 
Um, so I have personally been involved in the provider education. I was one of our other team members. And so far, you know, the response is very positive. Um, you know, I think overall the fellows have been more responsive just because they are currently in training. Um, and a lot of it is just overall changing practice habits. We all have those heuristics that we go to. And, you know, anytime you make a new change, it's always going to be difficult. And that's why we really wanted to come out with demographics with specific recommendations to, specific recommendations to say, you know, here are the times when you need to think about using a micropuncture needle because your results are going to be better. This is an interesting blending of kind of identifying whether something is better in your own situation, your own practice, drawing from literature. It sounds like it's a somewhat unproven concept in terms of the overall architecture of, of interventionalists out there, but it's emerging as, as something that people are feeling a little bit more confident with. And then you layer on spreading a concept across an organization, which is um, or across multiple organizations, potentially, as Dr. Four mentioned. Um, and in the context of having something that's emerging as a new, um, possibly better intervention, um, are there other stakeholders that you've run across that have some reticence um, outside of just the interventionalists themselves? Are there other stakeholders who are maybe concerned about the newness of it or some other aspect? Uh, not that I've personally encountered, although I agree with you, I do imagine, you know, you know, when we're talking about this, about using new or different products, money is always involved. My understanding is that it's not that much more expensive to use versus a standardized needle, um, but our biggest barrier is going to be compliance with the interventionalists. Um, some are more on board with others. Um, it really is just about, about changing practice habits. I think that for any kind of new intervention, it just takes time to become a standardized practice. Um, you know, like I've talked with uh, Dr. Volt, he's one of our pulmonologists, and he talks about back in the day when he's teaching himself EBUS before it was considered standard. And now, you know, every pulmonologist is trained in it. It's just a matter of evolution of our practice over time. Other questions? Thank you. Well done. I don't know about you all, but I'm really impressed with the quality of the work that's been presented so far, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next two. Um, close out here. All right. Oops, there's the timer. All right. Well, um, we're into the last two presentations, and uh, our next presenter representing the Department of Pediatrics, um, actually we have two presenters, Dr. Um, Elizabeth Brook and Dr. Caroline Hawes, and they will be presenting on increasing admission medication reconciliation completion rates for pediatric patients admitted to the Pediatric Hospital Medicine Service at Children's Hospital at Erlanger. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Hawes. This is Dr. Brooke. Um, we are both senior pediatric residents in our third year um, and are excited to present our project to you today. So to start off with a little bit about our problem and background, um, I think that the idea for this project for both Dr. Brooke and I came from experiences as residents of working um, inpatient and seeing um, medication errors occur. Um, and so our problem really is looking at um, the completion of our admission med recs. And as of November of 2020, according to um, Epic Crystal reports, this was occurring at times less than 60% within 24 hours of admission. 
so it was poorly completed, but also um, poorly defined in terms of the roles amongst residents, attendings, nursing, and pharmacy staff. And uh, there is definite links between medication errors um, and admission med medication reconciliation. And so some of these medication errors can cause things like adverse drug events, prolonged admission or readmission, and even sentinel events. So we felt that this was a very meaningful project to look at. Um, I think I know what's happening when that happens. Hey, John? Yeah. Yeah. No, I might just have to edit that thought again. I think it's because we couldn't hear you. Oh. You should be able to click here. There, I got it. There I just go. pushed F5 again. There we go. There you go. All right. Okay. I just have to keep pushing F5. Okay. So to kind of begin where, to know where you're going, you have to know where to start. And so we did, uh, the first thing we did was develop a survey to do kind of some fact finding to see what our colleagues in the pediatric department understand about medication reconciliation, what the process is. So we had created the survey um, for the 2020 and 2021 um, pediatric residents. Out of 24 residents, 17 uh, responded. So that's actually a pretty good response rate. That's about 70.8%. And there were 11 questions, but we're only going to talk about a handful today, just a couple. This one was specifically, whose job is it? Um, as you can see, everyone thought it was the intern's job to make sure it got done, followed by um, the senior resident and then nurses. Um, if you don't know whose job it is, um, there's a saying out there, if it's everybody's job, it's nobody's job and it never gets done. Um, and the concern there is if you're thinking someone else has already done it, um, are you going to be more diligent to make sure that the dosing is right, the medications are right, nothing's missing? Um, and then just for instance, there's an, the other section on there was just one resident who said that, um, that they were kind of confused at who it would be and it was hard whenever the parents didn't have updated medications. Um, and then another question that's not on this slide, but just for some more background, we asked residents, well, how did you learn how to do, to medication, do a medication reconciliation? More than half of the residents said, I had to figure it out on my own. And 35%, a little bit more than a third, said it was from my senior resident. And 75% of those residents during that time period wish they had had better training or more training in this area. We've not moved it. We have to bring There, okay. All right, so one of the other questions that we wanted to talk about was, well, where do you do the medication reconciliation? And again, um, more than half said that they had taught themselves. So this is, I know it's probably not a, a great image from where you guys are sitting, but on the left is an example of the admission tab where you, when you first click open the admission tab for medication reconciliation, this is where it starts, is in tab B. Um, and so they had an option and then an other option. And then the majority of 88% chose tab C as where you do the medication reconciliation. Um, for the other category, category um, someone had said, tab C um, is where you would normally do it, but most of the time parents don't know the medication dosing or they're busy, so they do it at D, um, tab D. The correct answer is actually A because that's where you actually review the medications. C is where you decide whether or not to continue those into the inpatient or um, just hold them. Um, so the next one. You have to push F5, sorry. There you go. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Before we move on to talk a little bit more about the specifics of our project, I wanted everyone to be on the same page in terms of understanding what we mean when we say medication reconciliation. And so this is our working definition of that. Um, it's the process of creating the most accurate list possible, which includes drug name, drug dosage, including importantly, especially in pediatrics, the concentration of the medicine, the frequency, the mo including most recent dose and the route. 
And then you compare that um, against the physician's admission orders and make clinical decisions based on that, what medications you're going to continue for that hospital, as well as transition points within the hospital stay, but we were looking specifically at admission. So our aim statement for this project um, is specifically that by April of 2022, 75% um, and then in parentheses 90%, which I'll explain in a moment, um, or more of patients will have their, at their admit med rec um, completed within 24 hours of admission. The reason we have two different percentages here, and we talk about this a bit more at the end of our presentation, but one of the most challenging things for us was getting reliable data from EPIC to represent what we were wanting to look at. And so a lot of our initial data had um, completion rates as low as 60%. And so based on that, our initial aim had been 75%, but with multiple different iterations and work with EPIC and IT, it ended up being um, a much higher percentage. And so we moved our goal to a 90% completion rate. This is just our fishbone diagram and I've starred the areas that um, are some of the areas that Beth was highlighting that we looked at specifically when we were defining our problem. So looking at clear protocol, um, and then looking at people and roles that are involved, as well as looking at um, the EPIC process itself and the, autom the automation of the process in EPIC. So our measures for this project, our primary outcome measure um, is as listed. So we were looking at the percentage of medical rec uh, percentage of completion um, within 24 hours. So specifically, we looked at the number of admission med recs completed per week within 24 hours, and then divided that by our total number of admissions per week on the pediatric hospital service. For our process measures, we primarily used our survey of residents to look at the process of understanding um, how to complete it, what it is, and why it's important. And then for our balancing measures, we mainly wanted to look at resident satisfaction in the process, as well as looking at whether or not this process and emphasizing it was taking time away or lengthening the time um, that it would take for admission overall in, in resident workflow. Okay, so our first PDSA cycle was specifically an educational intervention. This took place on August 6th of 2021. And it consisted of a lecture given to pediatric residents by um, Dr. Brooke and myself during one of our morning report time slots, which is a 30 minute time slot. This involved a PowerPoint presentation, as well as a live epic walkthrough of the, the workflow for MedRec. Okay, so it was just a cute little slide. So getting schooled. So once we had done the educational component for the residents, we um, kind of trended that for a while and we'll get to that, uh, that in a second. This is actually the same survey that we had done in the 2021 year um, that we repeated this year after the educational component and another intervention that we'll get to. And so this is just basically to show you a little bit of difference um, if there was any difference. And there was a little bit of improvement. Um, this is again, the educational component was in August the 6th. Um, there were lots of good questions and discussions at that point. Um, for this survey, uh, there was 18 residents that responded out of 25, so that was a 72% um, response rate. Um, it's still not great, not a lot of movement, but I would still say an improvement. This slide is, again, the landing slide. Again, this is after the, um, this is a part of the post-survey. In my opinion, this is a great improvement. As you can see, nearly third of the respondents no longer chose landing page C, which if you remember again, is 
where you actually decide to continue medications in the hospital or not. More people chose A, it was great to see that. And then D, there were actually um, three individuals of that 18 that chose um, the option of other. And all of them said that you would start at A and then go to C. Um, and so that for me was a great improvement. Um, next slide. Um, this is by week. This is five weeks before and five weeks after the um, educational intervention. As you can tell, there's, there's not really a great um, improvement at all. Um, didn't really budge all that much um, and it wasn't very sustainable. So that's kind of what I got from this data. So for our second cycle, <clears throat> we did um, what I call the Epic Patient List Intervention. This was specifically adding a column um, to our EPIC list that simply said whether it had been done or not done. And this is the list that's used by all of our residents and attendings. This was done in December of 2021. Okay, this is just to show you what that column looks like. Um, and this is the results of the um, intervention of just adding this visual reminder. With this visual with this visual reminder, again, it's still not very significant, but I would say that you can see that there's more of a positive trend um, to show that there's improvement with medication reconciliation. Okay. This is an, a demonstration of the whole year with interventions noted in, it probably looks purple if not blue on the main screen. Those were the interventions August 6th and December 3rd over the month. And as you can see, there is a positive trend with improvement. Um, I will note that there are some dips in November and April. Okay. And this is a better representation that kind of shows you the interventions, which are the red arrows. And then you have your um, confidence, con confidence intervals um, marked at the top and the bottom. As you can see, there was a more sustainable and improve, improvement with the addition of the column on EPIC. But again, it was not um, significant as it did not cross any of those um, confidence intervals. Your, your final thoughts. Okay. okay. So overall, I think um, just to summarize our discussion um, that we did reach our aim, but we're not really able to show yet that that is sustainable. And our key breakthroughs were looking at a system level intervention. So making a change in EPIC versus human individual level or education um, that the system level obviously showed a greater impact. Um, and then the difference between an ongoing or repeated intervention versus a single time occurrence. Um, and again, looking at this idea of clarifying roles and that if we can't do that, then nobody is going to know who, whose job it is. And this was just some of the barriers we kind of talked about um, having um, interventions by people focused versus systems focused, um, knowing who to go to and trying to get the proper data to further evaluate. Um, and then these were just other PDSA cycles we can talk about later. What questions do we have? Um, so just, uh, just coming from working on the pediatric side too, um, what, uh, you touched upon this for a little bit was uh, how difficult it can be to kind of reconcile some of these medications, particularly on the pediatric side of things where there's so many medications that are compounded and may have different formulations and everything. And you go in and ask the parents, what do you give? It's like, oh, we'll give this medication. We give five milliliters, but you don't know dosage or anything like that. Is there anything in place or any future way that you're, when discharging the patient, whether or not you've got, you're planning on doing like a discharge medication list where it's got something that they can easily give to the provider rather than just the, the typical after visit summary or anything like that? So unfortunately, this is one thing to realize from QI is you may have all these big lofty goals, but again, you have to kind of know where you're at to get started. And if nobody's actually even doing the medication reconciliation, that quality kind of control um, will be a future effort right now is to kind of identify more of the flow so we can correct that process. Um, there is a great need to um, improve the 
the quality of the medication reconciliations at every point of transition, which MedRec is at admission, transfer from the ED to inpatient, inpatient to PICU, PICU out, all of those things are areas for improvement. Um, so unfortunately, this was a much smaller scope than we wanted, um, but that was one of the lessons we learned. Um, and definitely on PEDS, that is the biggest um, barrier and concern besides having all these different concentrations, what, what we have in the hospital on formulary, um, if parents understand why it's important to know concentrations of solutions, and if the compounding ther uh, pharmacy actually lists on the bottle, like, hey, this is how this is made. I, re I really like the concept of this project. I think it's really important as someone who's dealt with a poorly reconciled admission when you're trying to discharge a patient and then the AVS is incorrect. I was curious. So one thing I noticed um, last time I was on the inpatient team was we would have patients admitted um, maybe the night before, or the day before, and their med rec wasn't completed. And then it's a little difficult, like say the parents aren't there. Um, if there's something that wouldn't be too difficult and epic to alert right on admission that the med rec hasn't been completed, I think sometimes it can look like it's been completed because nursing staff has put some information in but it's maybe not quite accurate or it's not reconciled with outside information that's been pulled in from outside places. So if there were like a way to flag that it hasn't been completed because I, I appreciate the list that we print out, but that's kind of the next day's team sometimes or not the people that originally admitted the patient. That, and that's a great area for improvement and um, I appreciate those thoughts. And I think um, a lot of people misunderstand that the nurses can't really do a whole lot to the list. It's still, it's still on the physician to do it all. Um, incorporating in this as to more of a team effort, which, which it needs to be, will be very beneficial, but it first needs to start with um, clearly identifying those duties and those roles so everybody's on the same page, um, and then having a better way to alert the physician or the team members that, hey, um, pharmacy or this nurse has now added a new medication or has clarified something, and so now the med rec is no longer um, up to date. And so that's, that's a, definitely a, one of the future things that we want to see happen. Thank you guys for the presentation. Just a thought, you know, this could be an area where medical students might be able to help you out as far as going in, talking to the parents, getting the list from their mouth. That way the intern, the residents aren't tied up with that history taking part. I got to do a bit of that on my family rotation and my adult medicine rotation, and it helped me learn a ton about the medicines and hopefully save them some time. So it's a thought. I like that thought. Um, it's just also making sure that people who are taking the medications that include nurses, because a lot of the nurses are associate level nurses, may not have had been exposed to some of these medicines, but that's a good part to add to the team. Jeff has that bated breath look, but one of your beepers is going off continuously, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's uh, I guess a baby's been delivered, maybe. All right, All right. Okay. any other questions? We had a couple of uh, technical difficulties during that presentation, so I gave a little bit of grace on the time. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, presentation, good job. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay. All right, yeah, I appreciate it. All right, so our final presenter today is also from the Department of Pediatrics. Um, are you all both gonna present? Okay. All right, perfect, okay. So the presenter today is uh, Dr. Uh, Jacob White. Uh, he goes by Jacob, not Ethan. And um, the, they will be presenting on uh, rapid MRI, a modality for evaluation of shunt malfunction. And Dr. White's uh, supported by Dr. Jared Amos. All right, thank you guys for your time here today for closing this session out. I'm gonna start my timer so I can keep myself oriented in the 12 minutes that we have here. So like Dr. Bennett said, my name is Jacob Wyatt. I'm a pediatric resident. I'm gonna be presenting this project to everyone today, but by no means was I the sole person involved in this project. And this actually began a couple of years ago. I had the opportunity to jump in about a year and a half ago um, as things were moving forward. We'll talk about, and Dr. Amos here has been um, uh, invaluable in um, sharing this workload and getting things moving. Um, I would like to give a shout out, the, what did we decide here at the space bar? 
oh, there we go. Um, to the initial resident in our program that began this a couple of years ago, um, Dr. Anna Varela Windemuller. She's now one of the community pediatricians here in town and um, that got this ball rolling, but wasn't able to see it through by the time she finished her graduation. So um, what we're talking about today is the use of a tool called rapid MRI for evaluation in um, potential shunt malfunctions. And so in order to talk about that, we have to understand what uh, disease process we're referring to, um, why we have to evaluate these shunts and, and what's going on. So here's a nice cartoon um, of some neuroanatomy um, and is a, is a good way to visualize what uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt is and why we have to um, think about them and how they affect the care of our pediatric patients at this institution. Now, I'm going to be going into general pediatrics, and um, as a primary care provider, um, longitudinal care is something that's very important to me, and, and trying to maintain the highest amount um, of quality of life, making sure that anything that a child's getting throughout their healthcare exposure is not increasing um, the incidence of any kind of iatrogenic complications or, or diseases that may sometimes be a consequence of the interventions that are, um, we take place to, to care for kids. Um, so as a pediatrician um, working in this hospital or any care provider in the, in the children's hospital, you almost certainly will encounter a child with a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Um, they're not as uncommon in our population as we'd like to, to think. Um, there's definitely more problems of hydrocephalus, so um, increased CSF production um, or presence inside of the brain. In poorer countries, it tends to be higher, a rate of about 300 per 100,000 live births. In um, countries that have more resources, like the United States, that tends to be much lower in the 60 to 80 cases per 100,000 live births. Some of that may be related to differences in neural tube function um, or defects in um, uh, countries with less resources, or perhaps um, something to do with infection rates uh, being differential. But plenty of things can gum up this, uh, this system that drains CSF. So you see here in a child with hydrocephalus, it's got the um, ventricle, the lateral ventricle, which my five-year-old calls the lobster claw, um, and the third ventricle, which has been aptly named the chicken head on a straw. But point being is that these structures can get enlarged, but the placement of a surgical catheter into the CSF space, into the ventricle, attached to a reservoir that has a one-way flow valve is um, a, a curative um, or sort of palliative a procedure that can be done for children that have um, issues with enhanced uh, or sorry, diminished um, CSS, CSF absorption. Um, now, one of the issues with ventricular peritoneal uh, shunts is that there's a high likelihood um, that it is going to fail over the course of that device's lifetime in the patient. If you look at some of the neurosurgical literature from the 2000s, um, you see a lot of 30, 40% case failure rates. Um, and that's because kids are going to be growing. Um, these are high risk procedures and the likelihood of needing a revision is definitely not zero. It's actually um, quite elevated. So there's been plenty of research looking into um, why this is and how this procedure can, can be um, uh, augmented in the future to allow more time to failure. So this was a prospective study that was completed looking at how do we um, predict how long it takes for a shunt to fail. And some of the data that I find valuable for this is that if you look at this um, Cox uh, regression model and looking at the time to survival or, or time to failure of a shunt, um, it's pretty elevated. You can, you can diminish for all of these groups that it's in that um, you know, 60% plus range, um, uh, 60, 70% likelihood of survival. Now, this paper particularly found that kids under six months, kids who had a chronic heart condition um, and kids that had an endoscopic, meaning a very specific type of surgical approach to these placements tended to have um, failure uh, earlier or more frequently. Um, but the point being is that this is, this, there's a high likelihood of shunt failure occurring across life of the device. And when you're worried about a shunt failure, you have to evaluate for a shunt failure. And so there it goes. And um, how that is, is historically been done is using whatever technology you have available. This is um, some data. Both of these papers come out of um, a national sort of emergency department registry data set that people will periodically review and try to find out um, if, there's, if there's meaningful things that, that we can determine. And when they were looking at sort of estimating how many kids uh, annually get evaluation for shunt failures in pediatric emergency departments. Um, some of the numbers that they were able to generate um, indicated 
uh, surgical interventions in around 66% of kids, or sorry, and 33% of kids who are presenting for a possible shunt failure. Um, and if there's imaging that's pursued at all, it tends to be uh, uh, with a head CT, computed tomography, uh, computed tomography using um, radiation in order to try to generate a three-dimensional structure picture and figure out what's going on with CSF. Not surprisingly, if a child's having problems with increased intracranial pressure, it tends to declare itself one way or another through symptoms or through time. When time is brain, if anyone's familiar with the Monroe Kelly principle um, of the brain, you have a vault of bone, you have blood, you've got CSF and brain. And if one space starts to enlarge, others will be compromised. You definitely don't want your brain or your blood flow being compromised. So if a child's having symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, headache, nausea, vomiting, rather nonspecific symptoms in the world of pediatrics and medicine in general, um, there may be a risk, but there are certainly some warnings that can um, have a higher chance of predicting a problem like peritonitis or increased pressure in the eye via papilledema. Um, this slide is really just to point out quickly what types of doses of radiation you're talking about. In the top left-hand slide, you can look at some um, exposures in males and females of around 40 gray to, uh, sorry, 30 to 40 gray. Um, and this comes out of a paper in 2012 that linked cumulative dose of radiation over a child's li early life exposure to increased rates of certain leukemias and certain brain cancers. So we know that too much irradiation cumulatively can cause problems um, with inducing a cancer that may not have existed otherwise. Um, so if we're going to be chronically irradiating children's brains, we have to think about those 20, 30 year consequences of those life or death decisions that are often made in the emergency department. And then this is just a, an example of some relative doses of radiation. If you're thinking about the previous table in um, looking at the sort of 20 to 40 milligray as a pretty average dose that children will get for a head CT. Um, and you can compare that to sort of the minuscule amount um, through standard plain film radiography. Notice MRI comes with no radiation. Um, and then you, you can all be aware, certainly not the point of this talk, but there are some conditions in pediatrics that I'd like everyone to be aware of where there is an increased risk of developing some type of an oncological process um, via exposure of um, uh, radiation. So leading into our QI project and um, what we really wanted to show, um, so number one and one and one and one. Um, kids with VP shunts are gonna probably need some CT scans at some point to evaluate for shunt failure. We know that this may incur a risk of developing brain cancer down the road we should try not to do that whenever it's clinically safe to do so. And um, there's some studies that show rapid MRI is not inferior. So our aim statement, we really wanted to take a look at what was going on in the PDZR and try to reduce the amount of shunt malfunction evaluations being done via CT scan in lieu of a rapid MRI protocol. So um, Dr. Wendell Muller began the QI process a couple of years ago and began to think about what is happening in our institution that's creating a barrier for us to get an MRI. Um, your standard fishbone diagram was performed and it showed a couple of things that really stood out. One, there wasn't uh, as much uh, education as there needed to be amongst providers on how to get that ordered and how to make that happen. Two, there were some communication breakdowns with the radiology department and some individuals that weren't as familiar with the process or how do you even get a rapid MRI going if I've already got somebody on the table. Um, but uh, there were several meetings that occurred and eventually um, they were able to get this uh, um, sort of QI project going to figure out if we could um, make some changes. Now the, the primary outcome measure that we've looked at so far is percentage of shunts that are evaluated by CT scan or via MRI. So uh, that's the main data that we're looking at here. But in our um, PDSA cycles, we found some secondary process measures that we think might be able to be tracked in the future and kind of help us with tweaking this and honing it over time. So really our plan was let's just start doing rapid MRIs and let's work on how we can communicate and create pathways so that everybody educationally understands how to get that done. We did that um, and we were looking specifically at people in the children's emergency room from January of 2020 um, up until really the end of this year. 
as we were looking through, we found several problems with the way that um, kid visits were coded. Um, but ultimately, we were able to demonstrate, um, number one, meeting our aim statement, which was predetermined to be about a reduction to 60%. Um, that has come down quite nicely since the project was implemented, um, but it's not 100%. And our goal was not to completely eliminate CT scans as an option that the ER provider has at their disposal based, based upon clinical status of a child, but to rather put a nudge out there that maybe we can start doing these with the rapid process in order to decrease that lifetime of uh, uh, exposure to ionizing radiation. Um, the absolute reduction that we got, just looking at these numbers before and after our November 2020 implementation was about 29-30%. Uh, so we were able to accomplish our AIM statement and we were able to reduce the utilization of the CT scans for shunt evaluation in the children's emergency room. One of the barriers that we ran into was consistencies in ICD-10 coding, okay? So we were using a retrospective um, uh, tool, just pulling certain ICD-10 mesh codes in the ER. So the data that we have is only as good as the coding was for those patients at the time. And we found some inconsistencies and things that we're working on to try to help us track our data set better. Um, and we are thinking through several different possibilities uh, as to some other metrics that we can be studying as we're evolving this project forward and trying to keep our utilization rates low. Um, we wanna uh, work on how to best pull the data from coding. Um, and continue improvement with uh, communicating with all the individuals uh, from the ordering provider to the technician in the MRI suite. Thank you uh, for John Michael Giesland for helping us analyze these data reports. Thanks for Dr. Wintermuller for getting this started and Dr. Culbertson who's been our mentor. I'll take any questions. Um, could you flesh out a little bit what kind of intervention you did, like education? Did you educate ER providers, residents, or what are your ongoing kind of, what were the different PDSA interventions? So a lot of it was early intervention with the actual ED providers. Um, our actual uh, mentor that was our lead investigator here is actually one of our pediatric uh, ED providers, Dr. Marvin Culbertson. Uh, and he was able to kind of put together a little system type of thing where we were able to implement these uh, pediatric rapid MRIs. Now, in comparison, the rapid MRI is, usually takes about six to 10 minutes to fully complete, uh, as opposed to a CT, which is usually around three to five minutes for full completion. Uh, so time-wise, it's not much of a big difference in getting it. Our biggest lack of uh, of access to the pediatric rapid MRI was the availability of the scanner because we share with the adult side and there can be multiple like lines that are going in. So one of the things that he actually started was um, calling the MRI in between patients to see, hey, can you fit in a five minute case real quick rather than waiting the two hours and more, like, more than likely end up getting a CT scan as well too. Have you considered um doing sort of like an annual or biannual survey of the providers to see what they're noting as barriers? Because I feel like that would be a source of understanding what interventions would need to be done to kind of improve, to move forward. If is Or are the is your information mainly sort of just what you've heard? So, uh, so when we went back and actually looked at some of the charts and things, uh, we were looking at when was their availability to do uh, the rapid MRIs versus the CT scan. And I think we kind of had to gloss over that slide just real quick. Um, do you know where uh, the one with the barriers? Yeah. Um, but essentially, the main barriers were lack of access to the MRI, patient stability in those particular cases. So an unstable patient that may be Real, uh, uh, maybe hemodynamically unstable may not be able to go all the way to the MRI scanner as opposed to the CT scanner, which is right outside the door of the uh, emergency rooms. Um, it also depended on consultation with neurosurgery. If there was high likelihood of shunt malfunction, they were more likely to say, let's get the CT scan immediately. And then if we need to, we can reevaluate with the MRI. So 
multifactorial in when it was, and most of the ED providers were actually pretty good about uh, saying why they didn't do the rapid MRI, whether it was time-wise or, um, or if it was lack of access. Uh, and usually where we came in for most of the variation was we had some ED providers uh, for some of the ED residents that may not be on that side as much and may not be rotating through and just out of pure instinct and everything, just order that and it comes through as well too. And this is mostly just a clarification question. So this is gonna be mostly gonna be retrospective. So you would just pull charts and kind of just see what the ED provider said, why they didn't get an MRI. They were like, this was the reason why. Um, did you ever find um, any indication where they didn't even consider that at all? Yeah, so I think um, two things are important. One, when the initial um, IRB application for this project was submitted, it was really just geared towards retrospectively looking at a very small amount of data, which was what was the imaging modality of choice. Um, so I think when this was designed, it was asking that very specific question. But to your point, and also Merla, is we think that there's opportunities to run additional PDSA cycles on this project to try to help flesh out, okay, when we are getting CTs, perhaps what are those clinical cases or indications, or is it still specific providers or specific um, areas in, um, between provider decision and being enacted in the MRI suite? Are there some new or unpredicted barriers that are going on that are allowing um, maybe some other opportunities for improvement? Um, so we would like to do some, some additional planning. One, towards making sure that we're capturing everything correctly with the right ICD-10 codes. Um, and then perhaps sending out some surveys to those who work in the MRI suite or in the ER to get their understanding of further barriers. Thank you for your job, guys. All right. Well, I am delighted to say that we're about 45 minutes ahead of schedule, which uh, means that uh, that's going to go into our own PDSAs for next year in terms of how much gap time we put in between talks. Um, but let me go ahead and see if I can um, find my cursor. Where is the darn cursor? There it is. Well, I don't see it over here. This is frustrating. All right, here it is. All right. Sorry, guys. Um, well, I just want everybody to have this, um, this QR code reader. We are, we are trying to get feedback on our presentation model this year, and you all are essential to making that work. So um, this uh, QR code will take you to a survey. If you all are using your QR reader, please let me know if you're, if you're picking it up. Um, I may just expand it a bit. There you go. Um, is it working? Thumbs up. All right, folks. Um, we're asking for your feedback for the morning session, which includes the breakfast, the accommodations, um, the flow um, of the scheduling, um, as well as the quality of the presenters. So we definitely want to hear back from you all as far as how this morning has gone. Um, before we segue to allow our judges the time they will require to uh, consult with one another and, and share thoughts about what were some of the best things they saw today and, and which, which of these presentations encapsulated um, to the greatest degree what we're trying to, to develop in quality improvement and patient safety. Um, I wanted to give you guys a, a, just a, a quick opportunity to start the process of giving us that feedback. We will also be asking you for feedback on the poster section. It's all in one survey, so you don't have to necessarily submit it right now. You can hold on to it, and then after you've had a chance to also walk through our poster session, um, you can give us the full evaluation. But please, please do um, that, and also promote doing that amongst the other folks you see walking around the posters. Um, the more feedback, the better. Uh, our team is going to be using that uh, going forward. I also want to have a quick shout out to um, our team who have been putting this together. Um, I want to thank Dr. Four for his support and guidance and, and, and um, also for his long term commitment to not only the CLEAR uh, program, but this, this, uh, this showcase 
of quality improvement patient safety efforts in our departments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ford. Um, whatever the college does, Pam Scott has got her hands in it, and she is an absolutely amazing resource in terms of getting things coordinated. She's not with us this morning, uh, recovering from an illness, but I want to also thank Pam Scott for her long-term commitment to us. And I certainly don't want to overlook Tammy Elliott, who um, has been really done, done all the yeoman's work uh, in getting all this coordinated, dealing with my lack of uh, ability to stay organized and um, over communicating, I hope, with everybody in terms of next steps and, and resources required. Thank you, Tam. Are there any other announcements you need me to make? Well, let me welcome Dr. Haynes to maybe come down and, and give a few of his thoughts. I also want to thank you, sir, for your uh, support as you jumped into the uh, college leadership role. And uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I just have a few comments. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Bennett and his work, the judges for their time, and obviously the work uh, that goes behind the scenes. We take uh, 10 to 12 minutes. We throw all this stuff up here, but having done this for a long time now, uh, 10 years here in a resource limited environment. What you see on these slides is a very small percentage of all the work that goes into doing this. So I wanna thank um, especially the presenters, uh, those both who presented today and those who did the quality work that uh, weren't selected. It's, it takes courage to um, engage in trying to improve patient care. And I'll use the words of Dr. Worthington uh, and Dr. Burns, who are the only two tenured faculty on this campus. Um, it, if you stick to patient care and education and don't get mired in all the other things, we will do just fine. Now, all those other things tend to attract our attention and we all take bullets every day with all those other things. But at the end of the day, if we keep our patients uh, foremost on the front of our minds, and our attention and our learners, and that includes ourselves and in learning uh, continuous, uh, being continuous learners, um, I think we'll do well. The last thing, not last, but other things I noted were, it took uh, a lot of coordination across not just uh, the two or three people that were up here presenting to accomplish even one of these projects. So the multidisciplinary aspects of this cannot be overstated. So whether it's logistics, contracting, uh, housekeeping, nursing, technicians, physicians, we tend to be somewhat physician centric. But one of the comments I made was, what was the level of support behind um, you know, some of the data we see? And it does make a difference and we can never um, underestimate that. We tend to um, get relatively self-focused as physicians and um, I just wanted to acknowledge there's a lot of work that goes uh, to serving patients and delivering quality care that's way outside of the time that a physician is in front of a patient. Um, last and not least, that multidisciplinary aspects, and I know those who've been in family medicine a long time will, um, you know, probably tired of hearing this, but relationships build capability. So the fact that we're all here is significant in building relationships, encouraging one another to improve patient care um, and capture what we do. I have never been good at capturing that which we improve. And so trying to do this is very difficult and, and I encourage you to keep doing it and encourage your colleagues to do it. Um, and uh, last but not least, most of these projects probably started around the time for, uh, of our pandemic, our current pandemic. And so um, having this level of quality work in regards to, I'm sorry, in, in um, relation to a significant pandemic over the last uh, two years should not be overlooked. And so my last comments will be for those in the room to pass on to others is choose to engage and improve patient care. And I'm, I'm very uh, proud of the work that's been displayed here today and all the work that's also uh, done behind the scenes. 
And so thank you and well done. Okay, well, um, we will allow our judges to convene and uh, make up their minds. I'm going to try to stick as close as possible to the scheduled timeline that we had before because that's been broadcast system wide and we want those folks to have the best opportunity to participate in our poster session as well as the announcement of today's top presentation. So going back to that schedule um, at 1145, our, um, our jurors will um, provide us with their selection. Um, and after that, from noon to one, there will be the poster session up in the medical mall right next to the Friday market. Talk about a multitasking extravaganza. So we're, all, we're hoping to see, for those of you who are here mostly to present your posters, um, we hope that you are going to be visited by patients and families as well as coworkers in the system, and I hope that you will engage them as well as coworkers and or leaders of Erlanger and UT. Um, thank you all again for your great work. We will see you back here at, a, at 1145. Uh, for poster presenters, we want you guys to feel free to start making your way with Tammy's support up to the medical mall. Um, your posters, uh, poster boards, as well as some easels will be made available. If you have brought your own easels from your department, Thank you, pediatrics did not have enough. Um, we will make sure that everyone is accommodated in terms of getting their posters set up ahead of the, the uh, time to come back here at 11.45. Any questions? Waiting with bated breath to find <laughs> out uh, which of the presentations is going to be acknowledged as the best in show. But um, I, I do wanna take a brief minute just to thank everybody, first of all, for participating in efforts to improve the care of patients and hopefully have a greater regard for one another. I think at the heart of quality management is a recognition that things are complicated and it takes a lot of folks to do the right thing at the right time with the right stuff to get the right results. And so that awareness going into any problem is a, is a way to sort of accelerate the opportunity to get to understand why that problem exists, recognizing that, you know, it's not because of one thing usually. It's usually because of multiple things. And some of those things aren't mistakes. Some of those things are systems things that get in the way. I don't want to steal any uh, a Dr. Campbell's thunder because he may have some similar points to make. But uh, without further ado, uh, we have uh, Dr. Adam Campbell, our VP of uh, Patient Safety and Quality here to present the jury decision on our best presentation this morning. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. All right, thank you, Dr. Bennett. I appreciate it. Uh, first of all, myself, speaking on behalf of the uh, judges, Eileen and Jill, we wanna thank everybody for their presentations today. Uh, some of the best presentations we've seen in uh, this type of forum uh, uh, as well. I also like to thank the college, Dr. Haynes and Dr. Four for their leadership, as well as Dr. Bennett and Tammy, of course, we wanna thank Tammy. It's just outstanding job, just outstanding. Uh, the good thing is, you made it hard on us. So that's what we want as judges. Um, but a, a few points. Uh, we really appreciated um, the passion with which you presented the work. I think that's more important almost as the work itself. Um, and of course, um, this bodes well for the college and it bodes well for Erlanger in general and the community uh, when we see resident and even med student involvement at this level. Uh, excellent use of data. We saw a lot of data and how you're making data-driven decisions is very, very good. Uh, as well as a lot of collabor uh, collaboration, there's a good collaborative spirit. I think every presentation uh, showed good integration among several departments or several entities uh, to make these projects work. And a lot, of, a lot of thought went into progression. You know, what are the next steps um, and how this works? So I think you're gonna have a great uh, leg up on sustainability. So the future is bright, I think, in all of your projects. Uh, so good work. Um, very happy to see that. So the winner uh, had really good use of QI tools, good literature evaluation. The aim statement and the use of the fishbone diagram really level setted your interventions. And it was really a good understanding of barriers and next steps. So really 
those are the key points that uh, this presentation really excelled at. Uh, so without further ado, we would like, if you would like to come up as well, or not. You can... <laughs> these two led great discussions on all these projects. It was, it was not easy. No, that's, that's you, Dr. Bennett. Yeah. So we would like to recognize uh, uh, Drs. White, uh, Amos, and Culbertson for the rapid MRI uh, modality for evaluation of shot mouth medication. Yes. All right. No doubt about that. Oh, sure. <laughs> Get the side. Here. Can we get all the presenters to come down and get a photo? Yeah. Yes. And if you're members with you, please um, have them come along. Dr. Four, would you like to join us? Or we could go up to the top there, maybe. Um, Keep hitting that button, but it's not turning off. I don't know if it just takes a while. Yeah. Oh. John did it in the back. Thank you all. Great work. Presenters and your team, you will be receiving a piece of